Hey, so I want us to take a look at graphing some ellipses. Those are the beautiful conic sections we get when we slice just slightly askew, not parallel to the base, but get that beautiful oval shaped thing. There are two types of ellipses, of course, we've seen in the plane. There's the horizontal ellipse. That's the one where the, the a term here is actually greater than or equal to the B term. And those are the, the ellipses that kind of have their major axis be on the, on the horizontal. That's why it's called the horizontal ellipse. And then the vertical ellipse is a similar shape, but, but it's vertical, which means that the, the denominator of the y squared, there the A is the, is the big term. So the A is always the biggest term. And here, that's going to have a major axis that's uh, along the, X, the y axis, and that's going to be then vertical. So we have to also identify and be careful of which type of ellipse we're looking at. Let's just jump right to an example so you can kind of see these things in practice, because they're really kind of fun to look at. Here's a, a really pretty equation for an ellipse. I want us to graph it, and then I want us to find the x and the y intercepts. So what do I do here? Well, first of all, I realize that this is a horizontal ellipse. And why? Because here the a, well, I know a squared is 9, which means the a is 3. And here, OK, now what's the b? Well, there's an invisible denominator of 1. Remember, if you just see a number, there's always an invisible denominator, namely divided by 1. So that's 1 squared, which means b is 1. So here I see that a is 3 and b is 1. And so since the 3 is bigger than the 1, this is going to be a horizontal. And if we want to actually graph it, this is how I do it, by the way, I just say, OK, well, what's going to go on here? Well, if let's say x is 0. If x equals 0, then I have y squared equals 1. That means that y equals plus or minus 1. And that, of course, corresponds to the values uh, for b that I get if I look at b squared equals 1. So in fact, I see that the b equals 1, that's way up here, and minus 1 is here. And so already, I found the intercepts. And then what about the, um, the x-intercept? Well, what happens if y were 0? Well, if y were 0, then x squared over 9 has to equal 1, which means x squared equals 9, which means x equals plus or minus the square root of 9, or x equals plus or minus 3, which notice again is plus or minus a. So there's 3, there's a, and there's minus a. And if you now draw the beautiful ellipse, you see something. You know what? Here's an example where I'm really not very happy with my picture. Let me immediately jump to the fancy picture. Ah, oh, see, look how I drew it so beautifully. So there's the ellipse. And we could actually now give the x-intercepts which, of course, we did implicitly, right? Because they were going to be plus or minus a for the x-intercept and plus or minus b for the y-intercept. So the intercepts are going to be uh, negative 3 and 3. And the y-intercepts are going to be negative 1 and 1. Couldn't be any easier. Isn't that great? So again, it's a horizontal ellipse. And you can see that because the, the major axis of, of uh, the ellipse actually is along the x-axis. And that's why it's horizontal. OK, cool. Let's try another example. I love these things. So this example, I want us to take a look at this graph. And I actually want us to inevitably find the lengths of the major and minor axes. So first we have to figure out what's going on here. Now, people might start doing stuff and taking square roots and so forth. And that is a great mistake. Because the first thing you have to do is you have to write the equation for the ellipse in that standard form where you've got something squared plus something squared equals 1. Let's take a look at this again and notice that this equals 16. So there's actually a little bit of work that, that we have to do, which no one even mentioned to us in the question. But we on our own have to know the first thing I have to do is divide through by 16. Now, if I divide through by 16, when I divide this by 16, 4 over 16 is just a fourth. So I get x squared over 4 plus, and then when I divide this by 16, I'm dividing both sides by 16, I get y squared over 16, and that equals 1. Now, that is in the right form. Now, which is bigger, the 16 or the 4? Plainly, the 16. So let me pull that out in front, because that's telling me this is actually going to be a vertical ellipse, because the value for the y is bigger. So I'm going to just write this just, just for fun. I don't know why. 
In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write the 16 as a perfect square. It's 4 squared plus x squared divided by the smaller, which is 2 squared, equals 1. Because that immediately tells me that a equals 4 and b equals 2. Well, that's awesome because that now gives me intercepts. It gives me, gives me a, everything. Everything is given to me now. Because where is this thing going to start? Well, this is going to have y-intercepts at 4 and negative 4. So way up here at 4 and at negative 4. And x-intercepts at 2 and the negative of b, which is negative 2. Draw that in. Whee! Hey, look at me. This is a better one. Oh! 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 That is awesome. I'm very proud of that ellipse. I'll show you the generic version, but I like mine so much better. We have to use mine. So here we go. So there's the graph. Now, where's the major axis? Well, since this is something where we, we have the, all the stuff, more stuff on the y than, than on the x, then the major axis is going to be along the y axis. And what's the length? Well, it's going to be, think about it, it's going to be, I went from a to minus a, so it's just double this. So you just double that number, 8. So this should have length 8. Let's count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yep. So the major uh, axis is uh, 8. And what's the length of the minor axis? Well, it should be 2 and then doubled, right? Because I went from negative 2 to 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. And 2 doubled is 4. So it works out great. No problem. You can find major, minor axes, whatever you want, length of anything. Turns out it's amazing once you understand the structure of the ellipse, both in its graphical and its equation form, you're good to go. The lesson here, always make sure you've got something squared plus something squared equals 1. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. All right, I want to share one last thing with you before we close this out because this is stuff is so much fun. You can actually use a graphing calculator, which is really fun. Boop, 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 you can do that by literally just typing in two functions. An ellipse is not a function because it fails the, the vertical line test. So if you type in the upper hemisphere, which would be y1 equals square root of 16 minus 4x squared, I'm solving for y. And then the lower hemisphere, which is the y equals negative square root of 16 minus 4x squared, then in fact your graphing calculator will produce, it's kind of a little sad, pathetic picture. Mine was much better, you have to admit. But it would look like this. And you could see, I mean, it's not, they deliberately aren't attaching them because, of course, these are two separate functions that we're trying to push together. So it would look a little weird on your computer. But you have to understand that, in fact, it is an ellipse. And even though that's a function, that's a function, the entirety is not a function. That's why you have to solve for y. And you get both square root and negative square root. And you can graph those things separately, if you want. If you want. Do you want to? I didn't think so. OK, so now I want to show you something really cool. So I want to come back, and I want to bring in the foci. So remember how this works. The ellipse is actually built around two foci that have the feature that we're looking for the collection of all points such that the sum of the distance from each of these two foci are the same. So remember this thing where you put this here, and then the string kind of goes around and, and that gives us the traces out the thing. OK. Well, where are those foci located? If one's at C, the other one is certainly the opposite side of the origin, which is at negative C. So that's fine. But how does C connect with the A and the B, namely the, the, the X and the Y intercepts, depending upon how it's positioned? I'm going to show you an amazing fact that connects the A, the B, and the C. And here we go. What I want you to do is just think about this length. This length is always constant. The string has always the same length. And here, notice what it is. It's just the hypotenuse of a right triangle twice. So in particular, it literally is just this hypotenuse, this length, whoop, and then repeated. Whoop the same length twice. So let's find that length. This length right here is length c. This length right here is length b. Because remember, c, I'm assuming, is negative. Uh, negative c is negative. So c is the actual length, you see, c. And so what is the hypotenuse? Well, the hypotenuse, let's call it h squared, is going to equal b squared plus c squared. Awesome. Great. And so if I actually solve this, 
for the, the hypotenuse, I see that the hypotenuse equals, well, technically it's plus or minus the square root, but this is a length, so we know it's got to be positive. And that's that length. But the entire string length is double that, because it's another version of that same triangle just flipped over. So the string has length 2 square root b squared plus c squared. That's the length of the string. Okay, But check it out. The length of the string also equals the span from negative a to a. And why is that? Well, because if you put this endpoint where they're supposed to be, the two endpoints here, I hope you can see this. Oh, I hope you can see this. Then if I reach this all the way over to here, watch this finger here, all the way over to here, what is that length? Well, that length, this little piece here has been doubled. You see, it's counted twice. So if I take that little piece and move it back to that piece, it fills up that length perfectly. So that length is going to be a, which is this length, plus another a. It's the length of the major arc, the major axis. And so the string also equals 2a. But now divide both sides by 2. Square root b squared plus c squared equals a squared. And if I take the square root of, uh, I'm sorry, equals a. And if I take the square root, I mean, if I square both sides, what am I saying square root? Square both sides, then what do I see? I see b squared plus c squared equals a squared. And if I solve this for c, the thing I want, what do I discover? I see c squared equals the a squared minus b squared. We just derived an amazingly beautiful formula that links the location of the foci to, in fact, the intercepts. You take the long intercept, the bigger intercept squared, minus the smaller intercept squared, and that will be the square of the, the foci. So just as an example, so that's just so cool. I just had to show you the proof because it's another great application of the Pythagorean theorem, which you know I love. But anyway, here's the question. Let's go back to the um, previous example, which you already forgot, but I'll remind you. Don't worry about it. Previous example was looking at the ellipse y squared over 4 squared plus x squared over, over 2 squared equals 1. And what I want us to do now is I want us to actually figure out the location of the foci. I want to find out where that first focus is. Well, I just use this fact. So c squared equals a squared, which is this, that's 16, minus b squared, which is 4, and so this equals 12. And so if c equals 12, I take plus or minus the square root. Now, the c is the positive one, so I'll write plus or minus, though. Just forgive me for that. I just can't help myself. Square root of 12, and what is that? Well, that's plus or minus square root of 4 times 3. Square root of 4 is 2 square root of 3. So that means that one focus is located at 0, 2 square root of 0, 2 square root of 3, and the other one is located at 0, negative 2 square root of 3. And that ellipse goes right around them like that. And that all came out of, of course, this amazing relationship between a, b, and c. c squared equals a squared minus b squared. And we proved that this formula holds for ourselves just by a clever use of the Pythagorean theorem together with the fact that the focus has that wonderful property, that the two foci, the distances are always the same out to the point when you sum the distances. Whew. Very fun, very interesting, and you can see the Pythagorean theorem is always lurking in the background whenever you see more than two things squared. Enjoyed thinking about the ellipses for yourself. They're beautiful. They're spectacular, and they take the circle and stretch it just a little bit. I'll see you soon.